Yeah, so I am very glad to be here today to, to present to you uh, the work I'm doing at Christian Landry's lab. So if you've been attentive this morning, I'm sure you can recognize this network and maybe some other pictures that are quite famous by now. Um, these type of network all group together uh, genes or proteins that are functionally related, so forming modules. And uh, well, to me they look like kind of uh, meatballs on top of spaghetti. And how these clusters or modules are connected together, how they relate and signal to each other, is kind of uh, scrambled in the spaghetti background. And this is what we have yet to uh, discover how these connections works. And to do that, we have to like crack the program of cell regulation. If you think of the signaling network as each node being a gene or a protein, that in fact is a um, conditional argument of a program. For example, it has uh, input. Uh, let it be a protein that is responsive to the level of a metabolite, for example, or to a protein-protein -protein interaction. And then you have the inputs that can be also protein-protein -protein interaction, or they could be relocalization, for example, or going to act, activate the transcription factor. So I'm sure that you understand that given the many layers of regulatory signals that exist within the cell, these arguments can get quite complex. But we have to start somewhere and we have to start by sorting out what are the input variables from what are the output variables. Well, so far we have been quite good at discovering what are the downstream targets of genes and uh, of protein, for example, for kinase. Uh, classical approach uh, involved knocking out genes or proteins and then looking at what happens at a transcriptomic level or the phenotypic level, uh, like phosphorylation for example. But if you try to apply this same strategy to identify upstream regulators, then you're going to face a problem that uh, for each gene that you knock out, you have to perform a new experiment and then the experiments pile up very high before even you get uh, to find one upstream regulator. So to address this issue, in our lab we developed a reporter assay that allows us to address what the effect of a gene deletion is not on a protein phenotype, but rather on one of its variables, one of its output variables. To do that, we have to leverage what happens, we have to leverage the information that we have about a regulatory protein-protein interaction. And what we did is to couple such known regulatory interaction with a quantitative survival assay in the budding yeast and then we cross that with a collection of strain deletion so that we can systematically ask what is the impact of deleting a gene on this particular output here in a quantitative manner. The prototypic example that we chose is the protein kinase A, uh, well because the regulatory relationship between the catalytic subunit BCY1 and uh, the regulatory subunit of BCY1 and the catalytic subunits is well known. The PK is a kinase that is well conserved between yeast uh, and mammals. And also uh, the processes that it is involved, that it regulates uh, are very important. For example, growth, it is also involved in stress response, in aging, in autophagy. And uh, we also have knowledge of some of the input variables. For example, BCY1 is uh, responsive to the level of CAMP in the cell. But there are still many unknown input variables to uh, this protein kinase. Uh, for example, we don't know exactly how its localization is regulated in the yeast, and also we don't know how the paralogous subunits uh, the paralogous catalytic subunits, how they are specifically related because they do overlap in functions but they uh, also have specific functions. In more details, the protein kinase A uh, forms a complex of uh, homodimers of the catalytic subunit and regulatory subunit. When the complex is formed, the uh, PK is inactive and that is when we see growth in our assay. <coughs> Uh, and yes, we chose two paralogous catalytic subunits to test uh, this uh, 
well, to construct this report or say. So we actually measure two variables, the C and the, that H stand for one protein-protein um, -protein interaction. In the lab, this is performed on a robotic platform on high-density agar plates that can ac accommodate about 1,500 different knockout streams. And uh, we, of course, perform a parallel control assay that allows us to control for the fitness deletion of the strain. And then we derived a relative PK score that tells us if the uh, interaction that we are looking for increased or decreased uh, with the gene deletion. And then we end up with a list of candidate inhibitors that would have a negative score in RSA and a list of candidate activators that uh, would have a positive score in RSA. Uh, with quality control experiment, we were able to set thresholds to have a rate of false positive at around 5%. So this, uh, these subset are either inhibitors or activators of the PKA are not actually in the same biological functions uh, in the cell. So uh, what you can see here is that we have an enrichment of positive candidate for several biological processes, and, but the negative candidates are enriched in another set of biological processes. And whether these are positive or negative regulators of the PKA actually gives us information to put into a model and try to solve this equation. Also, as we've seen before, localization matters. What we found is that our candidates are not randomly distributed. The subset of negative candidates actually uh, is enriched in the vacuole and at the endosome, uh, while the Positive candidates are mostly enriched in the nucleus, at the ribosomes, and uh, in the cytoskeleton. So what this may suggest is that the PKA is uh, translocated from the cytoplasm to the nucleus in its inactive form, for example, and then there are uh, genes that are necessary to activate it once it is in the nucleus, for example. And what these results exemplify is that in these complex formula that we have to solve, we have also uh, to take into account the where clauses that there are uh, in the cellular program, because this is very important. Um, as some of you might have uh, get, to get uh, together by now, is that we also identify indirect regulators, not only direct ones, because what we measure in this growth survival assay is a combination of factors. It's the end point, the end result, whatever the regulatory mechanism behind it is. Um, so it might be very useful, for example, uh, if the variable that influences the protein response is a metabolite, because then we see that candidate, candidates light up a whole pathway of uh, biosynthesis. But it's not always the case, and in the cases where the input variable is a protein-protein interaction or a phosphorylation, then it gets a little bit trickier to know what is the exact input variable. So in an effort to narrow down the list of candidates to the most direct one, we uh, performed a protein complementation assay, as was described uh, before in another talk. So we crossed our results uh, to have uh, those that are candidate in our PKA assay, so that those that we think regulate the PKA, but also have a uh, direct physical uh, connection to it. We also added mass spec experiments to have an orthogonal method, and we crossed our data with uh, biogrid uh, results too, so that now we have a couple of uh, leads that are quite strong and that will uh, make up for a good uh, follow-up experiments. In the end, uh, the big conclusion that we got from this was that a lot of the biological processes that are regulated by the PKA, that are known to be regulated by the PKA, actually regulate back the input of it. So there again, feedback loops. This, is, <laughs> this seems to be a common theme today. And well, I'm glad to see that we're not the only ones finding that this is very important. And in some instance, it might complicate matters to try and understand how the regulatory signal um, can travel in the network, but however, um, our ultimate goal is to uh, try and maybe hierarchicalize these modular uh, biological functions 
to put them in um, a sort of circle to understand which one regulates which one. And to do that, we will uh, engineer other reporter essay, like we did for the PKA, for other signaling hub in each of these modules. And then when we put back all the, re the results together uh, with help from computational biologists, then uh, when we put all the pieces back together, I just hope that we end up and get a picture that looks like something else than a bowl of spaghetti. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank my team. Uh, all the, the work was done in Christian Landry's lab at Laval University in Quebec City. Uh, I would like to thank those guys that helped me a lot uh, with this project that is still going on. So any advice w uh, about uh, this project would be uh, welcomed. And if you want to learn uh, in more detail about uh, the method, how it is done in practice, uh, there is a paper that Guillaume just published in uh, Cell Reports that you have the reference right here. So if you have any questions or, or if you need your coffee fix, I would understand. Thank you for the talk. Um, I was surprised to see that you have um, your reporter of the PK being active in the nucleus. Normally, it is thought that uh, the PK kinase will be activated by CMP, and CR1, which is the adenine um, cyclase, is at normally thought to be at the membrane. Do you have any proof that it might be localized elsewhere, or that you have a PK CMP independent? activation? What we see here is not the activity of the PKA in the enzyme. Okay. What we see is that the candidates are localized at the nucleus and that if we take them out, then the PKA is inactivated. So their presence is essential for the activity of the PKA. However, these localize in the nucleus. So if they are localized in the nucleus and they are essential for PKA activity, then we might infer that they are actually candidate activators. Thank you very much.